Hi, welcome back to Rust 101. This is video 14. Uh, we're going to look at some traits uh, that you you get for free as part of the standard library of Rust. Uh, I'm Andy. Welcome back. Um, okay, so let's have a let's dive straight into some traits to look at. So something we've already seen is the add trait, which is in the std ops uh, module. Um, everything inside the standard library is in std. And we've already seen how this works. So this is a trait where, where which allows you to say um, you can add two um, of these things together, or you can add this to something else if you want to be um, if you want to use the kind of more advanced way of thinking about it, where you add um, a, a type parameter to add. Um, and it also has this magic behavior that if you implement add for your type. Um, then you get to use the plus operator when you're using it. So most traits don't have that magic behavior, but add does. And also the uh, similar ones, like the ability to multiply, divide, subtract. And there are also ones for doing like plus equals and stuff like that. So um, there are um, traits, I forget the name. I think add assign and similar um, for allowing you to do plus equals and stuff like that. Um, Remember, you can't do, you can't make up your own operators. So there's this like fixed list of these traits that give you these magic behavior of being able to uh, provide your own versions of operators for your stuff. Uh, and as I just said, you can add two things that are different from each other together by doing implement add and then diagonal bracket the other, the other, the right hand side type. Okay. So that was add. We've already seen it. Um, now something much more difficult to understand. There's several things that are much more difficult to understand uh, that we are not going to go into uh, deeply here because we will talk about them later and each of them is worthy of um, a significant amount of time talking about which we're not giving them today. So don't worry. This is just for your awareness that these things exist and we will get to what they mean. Um, but yeah, there are these things called marker traits which are um, things that let the compiler know or let you know the compiler's telling you something or you're telling the compiler something um, about the type. Um, so they don't actually have any kind of methods defined in them. That's the, so they're markers. They're just for stuff. So the sized trait is basically uh, almost everything you have automatically implements the sized trait, almost every class that you create and stuff like that. Um, and it's just the, the general idea of the sized trait is that you can have a value of this type in a variable um, on the stack. Um, so a U32 is something you can put in a variable. Is Well, a U32 you can definitely put in a variable, just a number, so it is sized. Um, whereas a slice, not a reference to a slice, but just a slice is not sized. And a str, not a reference to a str, just a str, is not sized. So these are things that basically the compiler doesn't know the size of. It only knows the size of them if you take a reference to them. So we know that a reference to a slice um, is like a pointer to the slice and some information about its length. And similarly, a reference to a str is a pointer to some bytes that are UTF-8 and information about how, how long that is. So that's actually only two numbers, right, a str? Um, it's a pointer to where they where the bytes are, and a number that tells you how long they are. So it's it's like a known size. Um, okay. So anyway, we've talked about we've talked about sized and unsized things before in kind of um, obliquely. So this is this is how the compiler like marks them up, and it, it basically automatically knows most of your stuff is sized, and then if something is not sized the compiler will automatically know that. But the reason why this is an interesting trait that you'll see quite a lot is because you're going to see a lot of compiler errors that you're going to go, oh, why can't I do that thing? And it's because um, the thing you're talking about is not sized, probably because you're trying to hold on to um, an object using a trait as, it's, as a description of its of like what it is. You need, it needs to be a reference to that trait or a box of that trait or some other um, pointer like that. Because then the compiler knows, it knows the compiler knows the size of a reference, knows the size of a box, doesn't know the size of something that is that implements a trait, but you don't know exact its exact type. Anyway, um, enough on size. I said I wasn't going to explain them too much. Also, a couple of others you should definitely be aware of: um, sync, um, which is um, uh, a marker trait that tells the compiler that you can 
that multiple threads can refer to the to one of these and send which says i'm allowed to have one in one thread and then pass ownership of this to another thread and again most of your normal types that you create are going to be send um and are not going to be sync i think that's i think that's probably sensible fair to say so send just means like i can i can transfer ownership from one one thread to another so unless it's kind of magic in some way um that makes sense whereas sync says you can refer to it from multiple threads and that means essentially there's some kind of thread safety must be going on inside this type in order to make that okay because normally you can't refer to things um, from two places at once like that anyway those are markers so they don't have any methods in them they just let you know or let the compiler know um that uh that they these types have certain properties so those are things you need to know about but don't worry about it they're like advanced and we're going to talk about them later okay other traits that you get in the standard library another really interesting one is default um, this gives you really cool behavior in Rust that is hard to do in some other languages, which is it lets you optionally, if you want to, say you can, uh, th th there is like a default version of my type. So for example, um, if I'm making a counter class, um, then if I say derive default, then I'm allowed to say later on, I'm allowed to say, please give me the default of my, of my counter, which you can do by just saying, my counter colon colon default bracket bracket and it will give you back a my counter and the default one if you say derive default then it will um it, it will automatically create that for you so you don't need this bottom bit this is an alternative but if you say derive default like this it will give you a my counter and it will figure out the defaults for all the properties of my counter for you so you're going to end up with a my counter with a count of zero right because you just said make it make this defaultable in, in the sensible, normal way. And um, the compiler will go ahead and say, well, you've got a U32, so its default value is going to be zero. Um, if you wanted to do something different, if, for example, if you wanted your counter to start at one, well, then you can implement default instead of deriving default. Uh, and in that case, you need to make, provide a, you know, just like implementing any, any other thing, you provide a default method, which is essentially, no, sorry, not a method, an associated function because it doesn't have self here so this is a constructor which returns as a self as in returns a my counter and then you can set, tell it what to return so if you wanted the default to be one this would be how you would implement that so that's the default type um it's it's quite useful anyway just to be able to say look i just need a my counter and i want it to be the default um, but it's particularly useful when it's used imagine you've got a vec of my counter you can then say all right fill in a hundred of them with the default my counter, and there's a load of um, stuff that makes that really easy and simple to do. Um, so yeah, default can be very helpful. Uh, what else? All right, so um, a couple more things about copying types. So again, these are just types that are available in the standard library that you might want to implement or derive. Um, uh, but these are about copying. So there's two different types of copying in Rust. I think we've covered this before, but let's just talk about it again. So clone means um, potentially expensively uh, make a new copy of my thing by actually running code. Uh, and copy means um, just copy the bytes um, of this thing. And if something is marked as copy, then it when you pass it, not a reference, but you pass an actual thing of it into a method, then that thing gets copied instead of moved. Normally in Rust, if you pass something in without an ampersand before it as an argument to a function, uh, it gets moved, so the old one is no longer usable. If you mark something as copy, um, then it gets copied, and the old one is still usable, and the new one's usable. So cop marking something as copy is a way of saying, um, uh, making copies of this is so cheap that I want you to do it automatically when you would have otherwise moved it. Uh, so clone is quite normal to implement clone on lots of types and I would normally just derive clone and it would just do the right thing It will clone all the stuff inside you uh, You can also do your own implementation of clone if you do your own impul clone for type You need to implement the clone method. You can see here in this definition. There's no body to this clone method So that uh, that means basically someone who implements this trait has to implement that um, You can also implement clone from um, but you don't need to because there's a default implementation which just calls this. 
Um, so that's the clone trait. And you would normally, the only way I interact with this normally is just say derive clone. Um, and basically it means that I, I, for free now, I get a method on my, uh, uh, struct or enum, which clones makes a, makes a copy of this thing. Um, but if you want to, you, you can do some kind of custom implementation, which you might need to do if you hold on to some kind of pointer type or something like that, or reference type. Um, and and weirdly, yeah, cl copy is is like a, a marker trait, like the one, other ones we looked at. So it doesn't have any methods, but it does say in order to be copy, you must be clone. Um, so if you want to derive copy, which you can do, and that marks your type as uh, trivially copyable, so it gets copied when you pass it in as an argument. But in order to do that, you also have to derive or impull clone. Um, what else? Yeah, nothing else to say about that. Yeah, so your normal interaction with this is going to be derive clone to, to give yourself a clone method, and then also derive copy if you want your thing to be like um, essentially treated like an int or one of those um, simple types that get copied when you pass them in as arguments. What else? Okay, so other um, traits that are part of the standard library, there are loads, by the way, so we're only going to cover a few of them, but this is like a flavor of some of the most interesting ones. Um, uh, converting from one type to another, you use into and from, and how they interact is sort of interesting. Um, basically, when you want to convert something into something else in Rust, what you normally do is say a dot, in, you know, my variable dot into, and that converts from my variable into whatever type and not often the compiler knows what type you mean because the return value of this function or something like that, um, the return type is already defined. Um, or you can like explicitly say dot into and then colon colon diagonal bracket with the type you want to convert it into. Although that's, that feels a bit messy. So quite often it's nice. If, if the compiler can't work it out, it's quite nice to just say let x colon, then the type you want equal and then blah dot into. Um, and that's just, a, in my opinion, a nicer way of telling the compiler what type it's expecting. Anyway, point is, when you're actually converting stuff in your code, you normally call into. So into is a method on this into trait. Um, and you would implement it by by doing something like this. Uh, no, sorry, ignore that. Um, yeah, so you'd normally call the into method to convert things. But in order to tell the compiler that things can be converted, you would normally implement from. And then the reason why is because this code here exists in the standard library, which basically tells Rust, if you if you want something to be into, um, and it's, you already know it's from, then I'm going to give you a way of doing that conversion, which is just to, to call from. Right. So this code is part of the standard library. If you want to, you can impull into directly. But if you don't impull into directly, but you do implement from, then this will this will come for free. This into implementation. So somewhat confusingly, we, I think we've already seen. If you want something to have a two string method, you don't implement two string. You implement display, and then it automatically gets two string. Similarly, uh, if you implement from, you get into for free because this implementation already exists. And the rule is, if you can implement from and let into happen automatically, then you should, just because that's how it's already done for all the others. So basically, if you want to say um, convert from A to B, then on the type A, you would implement from B. Is that right? No, that's converting the other way around. I said it the wrong way around. If you want to convert from A to B, then on the type B, uh, you should implement from A. And that means you'll already have into B, implemented for a so now you can call the into method on on a thing of type a and you'll get a b okay i've probably completely thrown you by getting that the wrong way around but anyway uh, basically short answer is ignore when you're implementing conversions between things ignore the fact that into exists just implement from and then you get the into method which you can actually do the conversion with if there's some reason why you can't implement from for example um the types are just not in part of your crate or something like that. Um, then you can implement into, but that would be unusual and you should definitely check whether you can implement from. What else? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, next up is, um, so a couple of traits which are quite hard to understand. It took me a while. I think I probably haven't completely got my head around them. Um, but the thing to know about these is that they're generally used, uh, 
for the types of arguments to functions. If you've got a function that you're writing that does something with like a reference to something else, and you want um, people to be able to call that in a convenient way without thinking too much about the types, then you can use one of these traits, as ref or as mute, in your, as the argument type. Um, and so the signatures, we'll look at how we use them in a sec, but the signatures are um, that you, um, the as ref trait has this as rev ref function, which takes in self and returns a reference to T. So basically you're saying, um, uh, given one of me, I can give you a reference to this type um, T. And by the way, here, this is, so the interesting thing about sized, which I didn't explain, is that the way sized is used is that it's, it's, um, it's already there by default. So implicitly, on most times, if you just say diagonal bracket T like this, then there's implicitly, there's a colon sized, uh, written there for you like it, uh, it always assumes um the types you're talking about are sized unless you do this thing which is to say question mark sized which means it might not be sized so essentially by putting this colon question mark sized here we're saying um this is a more general uh trait than you would normally expect it could work it can work for things that are sized and things that are unsized whereas normally if we just put t here it would only be for sized things so um what that means here is that you probably don't need to worry too much about what, what it's saying here. It's just T could be anything, including an unsized type. And then the asref method returns you a reference to T. And this is, uh, as mute is very, very similar. If I've got a mutable reference to myself, then I can give you a mutable reference to a T. Um, yeah, so, um, sl slices can implement this because, um, of the question mark sized here. Okay, so I've got, done a lot of waffling without showing you how you use this stuff, and this is how you would use it. it was, if you're writing a function which takes in an argument, and that argument, you want to give flexibility to the people who call it. So what you're saying, by saying it takes in a t, and t is an as ref of this, you're saying you, you can pass in anything to me so long as um, I can turn it into a reference to a slice of u8. So in the examples we've got here, there's at least two things that, that work that can be turned into a reference to a slice of u8. One of them is a vec of u8. So if you just pass in owned bytes here, um, then it it will know it is able to take in that o those owned bytes and treat them as a reference to a slice of u8. Um, but it's also able to take in an array. This byte slice here is an array. You can also pass in an array, and that can also be treated as a reference to a slice of U8. So basically, it's convenient for the people calling print bytes. Um, they, you can pass in either a vec or an array, and because you've said anything so long as I can get a reference to a, U, a, a slice of U8 out of it is fine, um, then you get these uh, two versions of print bytes for free, one of, one of them for free, one of them you wrote, um, where you're able to just say, give me that, give me that hold of that slice of U8s, slice, reference to slice of U8s, and then I'll do my work with it. So you often see as ref and as mute as um, the types of arguments to functions in APIs that are trying to be flexible for you. Okay, hopefully that made some sense. Okay, so this is, I know we're covering a lot of ground here. Um, but this is just like a, a quick tour of things you can find in the standard library, traits you can find in the standard library. Here's another one, which again is special. So there are loads of non-special traits in the standard library, like Azref, I guess, and, as, uh, I guess, and Asmi. Those aren't magic in any way. Um, you could just write them in your own code. Uh, drop is very special. So drop is a very simple trait. It just uh, gives you one method called drop, which takes a mutable reference to self. Um, what, the reason why it's magic is because that drop method gets called whenever um, your type is being dropped. So when the thing that owns you goes out of scope. And the compiler automatically calls this. Um, okay, so here's here's like just an example bit of code. Um, so normally we don't implement drop on types because we don't need anything special to happen when they get dropped. But sometimes 
We do, and if we do, it's going to work a bit like this. So we just, just like any other trait, you say, okay, I've got this thing called inner. I'm going to implement drop for inner, so I just implement this method, and I'm just going to print out so we know that it happened. And then I'm going to make another struct called outer, which holds on to an inner and owns it. And I'm going to implement drop for outer, again, just printing out. Uh, and then I'm going to create an outer, which obviously contains an inner, and then I'm just going to explicitly drop it. Um, so what happens here? is it prints out dropped outer and then dropped inner. So uh, just the, the reason why we, need, we should, you know, the reason why this is helpful to think about is basically what happens is this drop gets called before any of the stuff that you own was dropped, right? So when the drop gets called, you've still got an inner. You could still do stuff with that inner. Um, so the outer one gets dropped, then the inner one gets dropped. Um and the signature of the drop method means that you're not allowed to drop self or anything like that in your destructor. And the, the, this, the reference to mute here stops you from doing that. Um, but yeah, I, well, I said earlier that, um, the compiler calls the drop method when you're getting destroyed. Actually, it calls std mem drop, which is this thing that you can explicitly call yourself if you want to drop something before you get to the end of the scope. Um, and the implementation of std mem drop, this is sort of a, a point of interest as opposed to something you need to really memorize or anything like that. But the implementation of std mem drop is just this. It's just takes in the x unused, that's why it's got an underscore, and then it does absolutely nothing. So why does that work? I'll give you two seconds to think about it. It works because the, uh, uh, when you call a method and you pass in an X, not a reference to X or anything, you know, not a reference to T or anything like that, but an X, which is an actual T, then this, uh, it might get used inside the scope. And then when it gets to the end of the scope, it gets dropped because you've passed ownership of this X into the drop method. So it gets destroyed at the end of the scope. And that means that, um, that this doesn't really make sense, does it? If the compiler is inserting std mem drop, then is it also inserting it at the end of this scope? That doesn't really make sense, does it? Anyway, the point is there is magic so that if you get to the end of the scope or when you explicitly call drop, um, then the compiler will call your drop method if it exists and then it will clean up the memory of your thing. So you can do stuff inside your drop method like clean up memory that the compiler wouldn't otherwise know about um, in the drop method. And so that would be how things like box are implemented, because they have to clean up stuff um, that they are holding on to that wouldn't automatically get things. The reason why box works so nicely and you don't have to think about it, you don't have to implement a drop method, is because box itself has a drop method in which it does clever stuff to make sure that that memory is tidied up. Okay, so one last slightly um, left field slide before the end of this video, which is just thinking again about how uh, functions with generic type arguments work. How does it? How does the compiler actually w uh, do this work? So imagine that we have back to what we had before, where we've got this trait called my add, and then we've got an add values function, which all it does is add things up. So there's a lot of adding up going on here in different layers. But anyway, add values um, takes in two arguments of type reference to T. Um, both of them implement my add. So you can uh, you can call my add on them uh, and returns another T. That's because my add returns one of these T's. Um, so we've got this add values function, um, but it's really a function template, right? Because depending on the T, it will do different things. Um, because these implementations of my add might be different, right? So um, when you call my add here, it looks like you're just calling a method, but actually what you're saying is, depending on what this T is, this is going to work out differently. It's going to end up calling different, you know, going to different places in the machine code of my program. So how does that work? Well, basically what happens is, um, if you pass in uh, i32s here, then the compiler will generate a version of add values, which is specific to i32. And if you call it with f32s like this, 
then the compiler will generate another version of this function. So the compi how does the compiler know what to generate? It doesn't do it just because this stuff exists. It does it because you called somewhere in your code, it notices, oh, they called it with F32. So I'd better make a version of this function for F F32. Um, so actually, these are two different functions getting called, which have just been created from this template that you've provided up here. Um, so that means it can be super fast, right? The, the compiler knows these are completely different functions. It doesn't have to do any work at runtime to decide which function because it's already been decided at compile time because it knows the types at compile time. Um, so it can be super fast, um, no wasted time there, but it can take longer to compile. Um, and it can, you can end up with, if you do this for lots and lots and lots of types, um, you can end up with a lot of copies of that function. Um, so your binary might get quite big. So if you, if you get problems with that, like you really won't, right? Like until you get deep into stuff, if you get problems with that, you might actually want to change your function. So instead of taking in, um, a type which is known at compile time, uh, and a generic type parameter, instead of that, you might want to pass in a trait object. So like a box of, of din t or something like that. Um, or a reference to din t. So that means the compiler doesn't know what type it is, it is at compile time. Uh, so it's only going to generate one version of that function. But then the actual execution of that function is going to be slower because at runtime it has to say, okay, what type is this? All right, I'll call this method instead. Um, so there's a trade-off there. Normally, uh, in my opinion at least, normally the way Rust um, does it by default this way um, is better and faster and nicer. Um, but sometimes you might end up in a in a slightly obscure situation where you've got um, code that generates a huge amount of code in your binary and therefore takes more memory and you have to the computer has to jump around to more memory locations in order to execute it. So you could end up that it's actually slower at doing it this way. But this by default, this is kind of the, the best way. Um, so that was like a sidetrack. The main thing we talked about in this video was just a load of traits from the standard library and some thoughts about how they work. Uh, and then we finished off with uh, what happens when you call a generic function. Actually, the compiler generates a special one just for you, uh, or at least the first time it finds the, the types that you've given it, it generates a special one just for you. And then it knows at compile time they call this version of it, so it doesn't have to do any work at runtime. Right, hope you enjoyed, and see you next time.